Hi, Billy. Uh, sorry I was too late to participate directly in your uh, So Memorial video. Um, but since the battle continued uh, from July 1st into September, it's still technically the anniversary. So here's my contribution, hopefully better late than never. Um, I wanted to read from a couple of essays by Paul Fussell, or Fussell, I'm not sure how his name is pronounced. Uh, he I, He's still alive, very old. Um, he was a literary critic, a veteran of World War II, um, who, who was bitterly anti-war as a result of his direct experience in war. And uh, probably his most famous work was a book called The Great War and Modern Memory about World War I. And he was the guy who introduced me to the genre of World War I war poetry um, in a couple of essays in this book, Thank God for the Atom Bomb and other essays, which I read like practically everything I talk about here um, about 20 years ago. Uh, I, could I, I, I could talk, uh, I could try and speak in my own words about what this all means um, to me, but then this thing would go on forever. I just want to jump around a little bit. Um, in one of his essays called On the Persistence of Pastoral, he talks about how World War I poets, poets on the front, resorted to the pastoral genre of poetry, uh, apparently incongruously. Strictly speaking, pastoral requires shepherds and their sheep and the young British officers who led troops in the First World War very often had recourse to pastoral images as they contemplated their responsibilities. In his poem, Going Into the Line, the writer with the quintessentially English name of Max Plowman contrives to dominate the bombardment by imagining an almost literal pastoral oasis. And slowly in his overheated mind, Peace like a river through a desert flows, and sweetness wells and overflows in streams that reach the farthest friend in memory. Now that he has quieted himself by fantasizing this scene, he can contemplate his relation to the men he is commanding, and he finds that he feels a silent secret, dear delight in serving these, these poor sheep, driven innocent to death. Then in a, another essay from 1984 uh, called Killing in Verse and Prose, uh, Fussell um, is reviewing two books, The Oxford Book of War Poetry, which had just been published, and uh, Studs Terkel's oral history, The Good War. And uh, the essay begins, a satire says, excuse me, a satire, says Samuel Johnson, is a poem in which wickedness or folly is censored. This being so, John Stallworthy's The Oxford Book of War Poetry might just as well be titled The Oxford Book of Satire. In No Man's Land, a poem by Eric Bogle, or Eric Bogle, I should say. A skeptical young person sits by the grave of a 19-year-old killed in the First World War and addresses him thus. Did you really believe that this war would end wars? Well, the suffering, the sorrow, the glory, the shame, the killing, the dying, it was all done in vain. For William McBride, it all happened again, and again, and again and again and again. That suggests the dynamics of Stallworthy's anthology. It provides over and over, piling it very high and very deep, material to gratify the harshest satirist of human nature. 
here a here a calumniator of humanity would find countless sadistic mass murders and a sufficiency of needless agony and bereavement, not to mention a plethora of stupid, bung, stupid blunders, failures of imagination, acts of ignorance and egregious carelessness with the lives and bodies of others. There's also a lot of fatuous complacency and optimism in the face of avoidable catastrophe, as well as happiness in the misery of others, all the way from the Hebrews' delight in the suffering of Pharaoh's drowning cavalry and the bloody-mindedness of Achilles to Seamus Haney's, or Heaney's, I'm not sure, Haney's, notations of the murderous absurdities in contemporary Ulster, etc., etc., etc. For the traducer of human nature, here is God's plenty, or rather man's. As Byron puts it in Don Juan, Let there be light, said God, and there was light. Let there be blood, says man, and there's a sea. And I'm jumping around here. It's only with the outset of bourgeois understanding in the 18th century that poets begin reaching toward, moder toward the modern theme that war is a total calamity rather than a welcome or not too bad occasion for displaying manliness. Only then does the idea begin to take form that victory is really defeat. He talks about Kipling, which I won't get into in the Spanish War, and he uh, reads a lot of World War I, or he talks about the World War I poets, and then compares them to the poetry of World War II. Um, and how the poets of World War II seem to have lost the the will to explain and the well I shouldn't even try to put it into my words because that's how these things get long um, he says of the anthology um, speaking of World War II poetry uh, I wish John Pudney's missing were here too for in its minimalism, its resolute disinclination to go on and on, or to try to interpret the uninterpretable, it is so memorable a registration of the quintessential style of the Second World War. Missing. Less said the better. The bill unpaid, the dead letter. No roses at the end of Smith, my friend. Last words don't matter. There are none to flatter. Words will not fill the post of Smith, the ghost. For Smith, our brother, only son of loving mother, the ocean lifted, stirred, leaving no word. And then he goes on. An American counterpart of Pudney's missing is Randall Gerald's The Death of the Ball, Tur the Death of the Ball Turret Gunner which needs only five lines for its understated work. It is in Gerald's poem that one sees the Second War poetic action in its essence. The speaker in the poem, the dead gunner, abjures, synta abjures syntax betokening cause and coherence. He is either disinclined or simply unable to do more than specify serially the crazy things that have happened to him. Understanding his experience is as far from his capacity as interpreting it, and he certainly does not object to it. From my mother's sleep... I'm going to start that again. From my mother's sleep I fell into the state, and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Six miles from earth, loosed from its dream of life, I woke to black flack and the nightmare fighters. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. And then I'm going to jump ahead uh, to some of what he quotes and says about uh, Studs Turkel's The Good War. Any student of anti-war irony must wonder how much and what sort oh 
I should read this ahead. I'm sorry. Any student of anti-war irony must wonder how much and what sort attaches to the quotation marks around Studs Turkel's title, The Good War. Even skeptics who think, quote, oral history, unquote, better designated oral fiction, or oral self-justification, are likely to be impressed by Turkel's book, which exhibits again his talent for eliciting significant emotion from the people he talks to. In essence, he is asking his interviewees who were in the Second World War in various ways whether the ironic quotes belong around the title. And of course, this was from 19, this was written in 1984, and, and since then there's a veritable industry built up around sentimentalizing World War II and the greatest generation. So this was a book at a, at a cusp of remembering, uh, not, not this book, but um, Studs Terkel's The Good War was at the cusp of, of trying to decide what, what to think about World War II, and it was made up of, of comments by uh, people who were actually in that war and not their children. Um, and I'm just going to jump around here, or jump jump to the very end here, where he's talking about a a woman who uh, one of the one of the women that Turkel interviewed, um, who had told various anecdotes about her her experiences uh, during the war. Uh, that girl's name was Deli Han and she is now only one of many here who registered the utmost life-distorting disillusion with the way the post-war world has turned out. The rearming of the Germans and the rapid reversal of the wartime party line toward the Soviet Union were shocks from which many will never recover. The United States government has forfeited the credibility and respect of more people than it knows and the vein of distrust and cynicism about national purposes runs very deep. Now remember this was written in 1984. Vietnam and Watergate and the Iran-Contra perversion are only the latest in a series of debilitating events that date from 1945 when the OSS was transformed into the CIA and the basis established for a secret government on a military model. Quote, when we started to arm Germany, unquote, says Deli Han, I was so shocked. I'd been sold a bill of goods. That was the beginning of distrusting my own government. Now, the rearming of Germany doesn't bother me at all, but I... Anyway, let me, let me go on here. Um, since, uh, the reason it doesn't bother me is that the Soviet Union, or I mean the Soviet Union, the, Germany has not contributed markedly to the uh, to the militarization of of world affairs. Uh, so the rearming of Germany must have been handled a little bit better than than the uh, institutionalizing of uh, a hyper armed United States. So anyway, pervasive also is the anti militarism of these reminiscences. An atomic physicist says. We can't afford to be weak, that's what the Germans said, and did. Look what happened to them. The same thing will happen to us if we don't cool it. Retired, uh, retired Admiral Jean Larocque spills beans, formerly out of sight, but now abundantly visible since the Iran-Contra business. Quote, Our military runs our foreign policy. The State Department simply goes around and tidies up the messes the military makes, unquote. The United States still tends to see things in terms of the war, Larocque points out, and he's talking about World War II, and the memory of the, quote, victory, unquote, and subsequent papering over of the agony and the cost, quote, encourages the men of my generation to be willing, almost eager, to use military force anywhere in the world, unquote. An English woman who survived the Blitz says of Americans, quote, I do wish they wouldn't be so keen to get into wars, because one day it will come back on your territory, 
and God help you. Unquote. A former artillery officer, a forward observer at the Battle of Hurton Forest near the German border, remembers, quote, I knew another forward observer. He went out with his crew. White, phosphor white phosphorus was thrown at him. White phosphorus was thrown at him. Two of the men burned before his eyes. He came running to where I was. I went down the road to meet him. He was sobbing and falling into my arms. He kept saying, no more killing, no more killing, no more killing. A rational humanity, which is what we have not got, would have no trouble ratifying that resolution. James Jones and his son, together with Willie Morris and his son, both 15 years old, and James Jones is a famous uh, World War II author. Um, anyway, um, James Jones and his son, together with Willie Morris and his son, both boys 15 years old, once visited the battlefield at Antietam. The four of them walked down the sunken road which just after the battle was known as Bloody Lane. Morris recalls the history of the place. Here, along a line of a thousand yards, the Confederate center took its stand, thousands of them firing at close quarters against the Federal troops charging across the crest of a ridge. It lasted three hours, and the dead Confederate soldiers lay so thick here that as far as the eye could see, a man could walk upon them without once touching the ground. At the end of the sunken road is an observation tower. From its top, the two men and the two boys surveyed the silent landscape. Quote, the way men quote, the way men go to die, Jim said, looking down at the ridge before us. It's incredibly sad. It breaks my heart. You wonder why it was necessary, why human beings have to do that to each other. Why do men do it? One of the boys wondered. Why did they do it here? After thinking a while how to answer that, qu that question of questions, Jones gave the simple, empirical, irrational answer any ex-soldier would authenticate. They did it, said Jones, quote, because they didn't want to appear unmanly in front of their friends, unquote. Considering the constant fresh supply of young men and the universal young man's need for assurance of his manhood, Jones' answer suggests why reason, decency, and common sense are as unlikely to stop the killing in the future as in the past. Animals and trees and stones cannot be satirized, only human beings. And that's the reason it's all going to happen again and again and again and again.